Hello and welcome to another episode of the Tackling Sport Podcast. It's Daniel here, joined once again by my brother Sean. How's it going? And yeah, Sean, we've a lot of action-packed weekend again, and we're going to start with the GA here on this episode. Um, firstly, what are your thoughts on the, just the throwing times? You know, obviously there's no supporters, so I, I personally feel they could have maybe staggered some of these ki- uh, throwing times to maybe get more games on TV. Yeah, well, look, there's there's always going to be that, but then I suppose there's practicality of of travelling to game and games, and I know a lot of the the, the football games, well, the mall are, are provincial, so it's it's not too far to travel but when you, you saw the conditions of last week and you know the lads can't the the men and women can't have showers after inter-county games you know it's um the the logistics obviously have to play a part in that and and yeah look i suppose the more you want to see more the more and more games on tv look at the the two ulster football games last week for example you know they call everyone's eye even with cab and monaghan so early on a saturday yet people still sat down to watch it so maybe it is a missed opportunity but there's so much going on that, that there's always going to be a couple of clashes um across all different coats yeah absolutely that's fair i guess it's it's tough as well be on players you know 130 is probably a good time on a sunday i just thought it was a lot of games on 130 to be honest with you so maybe they could be moved a few but i suppose um we'll start with the dublin footballers they're back in action away to west mead um i suppose it's, it's hard to remember some of the storylines in terms of, you know desi farrell he was getting on okay in the league. There was a couple of good wins, a couple of good defeats before lockdown. Um, they've looked okay post lockdown. Um, there was a poor enough performance against Mead and then a win of victory over Galway. How do you see Dublin going in there? Obviously, they've had the retirements of Jack McCarthy, Jeremy Connolly, and Darren Daly uh, in, in the last couple of months. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if Jack's fully retired yet, but he's just taking a year out. But Dublin, I, I suppose it's it's. Yeah, look, you'd expect to win. It's one of those performances or one of those games. You, you like, you, you've no idea what way it's gonna go. Like, it could be a a, a drubbing or, or West Meath could put in a bit of a show. And they've they've sort of improved in the last while. Had a couple of good uh, results after lockdown and 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 sort of, you know, with all the talk around um some of the stuff that's happened up there. You know, there's there's been a lot of sort of to and fro as to whether they were behind the decision for, for the games to go ahead. John Heslin, who was so vocal on Twitter about maybe the the dangers around it uh, uh, with players being in the community, he sort of changed the tune and, and, and back playing now. So there's, there's all that sort of stuff. And, you know, Dublin are, are back again and they're training more and more and, and maybe are going to be able to gel that that bit better as well than, than we saw in the Mead and the Galway game. And, you know, I wouldn't look too much into to either game. I think it was more get running in the legs for Desi Farrell. But, you know, make no mistake this year, it's it's Desi's on a hiding to nothing. The Dublin footballers are on a hiding to nothing. If they don't win the All-Ireland this year, you know, it's it's a massive disappointment despite, you know, everything that's around it and knockout football. Um, but you'd imagine that they'll, uh, they'll safely navigate Leinster anyway. Yeah, and it, like you said, it's it's not good football. I, I suppose it's a small bit of difference to what Dublin would normally have in Leinster, but at the end of the day, it's just another another Leinster game in that regard. Quick word actually on the slug of footballers, Sean. What did you make of the walkover given um, with the COVID against Galway? It almost seemed to happen all of a sudden. Almost, you know, there was definitely room in the calendar to push it out. I know the GA's got the rules to try and stick to, but um, like I heard a couple of good points, like they had a new version nowhere. Um, and that, that was a rule for two weeks before they gave in there. Well, surely there was a way to get this game played. Like, oh, it's like I haven't played a championship game, they're out. Um, and I don't, like, for example, look, just Westmead, Dublin. If Dublin had couldn't field the team, I'm sure they'd, uh, they'd come up with a way to maybe push it out a week. Yeah, yeah, look, I think that there's all that. that I've seen a lot of people sort of being been harsh on Sligo if you like and maybe could could they have played the game I mean Sligo Sligo's a small county if you actually look at the, the incidents it's you know it's quite high for, for a county of that size and, and, and I'm sure you know the, the the county board has been liaising with the HSC about, about everything and, and look you know th- there's no guarantee that the game in a week's time could go ahead with, with players uh, and, and confirm cases and close contacts and all so I'd imagine that was in the, the GA's thinking or you know the 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 CCC or whatever decides it because you know there's no guarantee that that the outbreak can be con- contained and and the game can go ahead in a week or two weeks and then all of a sudden you know the 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 kind of final whether it's Mayor or Roscommon is sort of eaten into that time and you know the GA in terms of they need to get the All Ireland done by the nineteenth um, football because the you know the next weekend is it, it's is Christmas and Stevens is and you know that's not going to happen so. You know, I could I could probably think that GA stance on is is there's no guarantee that Sligo will be able to fulfil 
the fixture in a week's time. But I, I didn't get all the the stuff um, saying whether, you know, the integrity of the competition. And yeah, I think everyone signed up to the fact that there's going to be these things happen because of COVID. And, you know, not everything is going to be, you know, the way it normally is. And I think everyone signed up to that um, in terms of the integrity of the competition. I mean, you know, if, if David Clifford or, or, you know, Connor Callahan, or one of the standout footballers in the country come, you know, the last last couple of weekends in, in December, come down with COVID, God forbid, you know, is the integrity of the competition going to be shot? Probably, yeah. But but everyone sort of signed up to it. But I, I you know, look, I, you feel for Sligo and Galway because they're put in the sort of unenviable position that, you know, what to do uh, and public health uh, and public safety probably comes first. But I didn't get the, the stuff to Sligo because, you know, and, and the GA are probably thinking there's no guarantee that this game goes ahead in a week. Uh, and that's going to be, you know, at the end of the day, why, why would you prolong it or, or postpone it if you if you think the same thing's going to happen? Do you probably think ultimately it was the, the right call maybe for the long-term viability based maybe on just if just if Sligo and just the fact that there would be no guarantee playing it in a week as opposed to, you know, trying to say it should have been more an effort. Like I personally, maybe they should have had more an effort to try and play it, but that was, that was just my opinion. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose there's going to be different different times this year where there's going to be different sort of rules put or rules applied if you like you know this game is the first round of Connacht yes like I haven't had a game to show themselves in the championship but if this is an All-Ireland quarter final or, or sorry semi-final or a Connacht final or a Munster final you know the game might be played on Wednesday but then you could say you know because of the outbreak because it's so much uh, and so many people have it and, and so many people have close contacts and you know backroom staff are affected you know that's probably another reason why the game isn't being postponed. Because, like I said, there is no guarantee that in two weeks' time the cases um, won't be the same or won't be higher for for that example. So, look, everything is going to be taken on its own merits, if you like, this season. And you know, if if there's a sh- if there's you know high number of cases in the camp of an All Ireland semi final or final, you know, there's going to be allowances made to the best of their ability. But you know, I can't imagine, say for example, the All Ireland being postponed two weeks because you know that one of the one of the high profile teams in the county has you know a high amount of cases you know before you know we're looking at yeah january all ireland and neaten into next year yeah absolutely and i think they have a thing in the real where it's all ireland semi-finals and finals are um are exempt or can be pushed back and they have a bit of a leeway there i guess so i guess worst case scenario if it does go into january it's not the end of the world in that regard but from one connacht what was meant to be one connacht game to another and ross common versus mayo how do you see this game going um in terms of Mayo's All Ireland challenge, yeah, well, a lot of people are sort of getting on the Mayo train again. You're yourself right? included now, don't don't don't. Be, yeah, yeah, you're, no, I, <laughs> good. I you're, saw, pro, you're driving, I think, are you? Yeah, I'm driving the bus. But the, <laughs> the the thing I saw in the first half from Galway was, I suppose, when it's the first game back and everyone is sort of not not too sure about how teams are going to go on. I thought Mayo brought the intensity to that game. Um, and, you know, for us all, that Galway were awful from the kickouts and they conceded. You know, Mayo sort of had that little bit of intensity um, that, that no other team really um, before the last weekend had shown. Uh, they got out to a slow start in the game against Leitrim. Leitrim were a couple of points up at times and then they sort of kicked into gear. And, and you know, if, if Mayo, if you like, are to get to the All-Ireland semi-final, they're going to have to go through Roscommon and Galway and, and that's not going to be an easy way um, and everything about them this year, the, the script is almost, if you like, people are writing it again, myself included. I think that they'll, they'll get out of Connacht. And, and when you do so, you give themselves every chance. And, you know, maybe with the lack of fans, there's that lack of emotion. Maybe it just gets reduced. There's no, you know, thinking of 51 or there's no thinking of five years ago. And, you know, everything can be focused more on the next ball and the next kick out. And, you know, one thing that people have always labelled that Mayo over the last five or six years, maybe even longer, when, when they were getting to semi-finals and finals, is they never seem to add anything to their squad. And, you know, it goes for every sport. If you win something, you know, the best way of, of pushing the team on is to add one or two players. You know, Dublin have been notorious for doing it. You know, after 2014, 2013, they went out and, you know, looked at Brian Fenton, Kieran Kilkenny, lads like this. And, you know, Brian Fenton, for example, hadn't played minor for Dublin, a late bloomer, and they still went and, and brought him in. 
there's our clowns, um, not a scully guys that are like this that have come in year on year to just give that team something else. And, and Mayo seem to have sort of found it or or, or been more open to it. And maybe the the club championship having you know the having the summer it had maybe it helped you know more and um the centre forward looks 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 a good player. He he's kind of someone that the Mayo haven't had in the last couple of years. A dry, a real driver from from centre forward. Kevin McLaughlin's not the player that, that he once was. Um so look I, I think there's a lot of positives around Mayo. Aiden O'Shea at the top of the square, I've always thought it is his best position. It's where, you know, if he can get the ball, you know, there's no stopping him for goal and, or he can pop it off to, to the shooters in in O'Connor or you know, Darty. So there is that um, threat there this year, and especially with the, the conditions. You know, any sort of slip of a ball, any sort of bounce, and, and it goes in. And we've seen that in games already uh, this summer, that or this winter rather, that that any sort of slip of the ball can really help the full forward. And you know, no full full back in the country wants to mark Aiden O'Shea. You know, with the wind, with the rain, mm. and everything sort of bouncing, anything can happen. And it only takes, you know, seven balls to go in, and one gets in the goal, and you know, the green flag is raised and all of a sudden the momentum of the whole game has changed. And there's something about a big full forward in there winning that, those balls and getting a half chance and bearing it that, um, you know, is lifts the team more than anything. And mm. Aiden O'Shea is, is very good at taking a point as well. And it's, it's a part of his game where maybe underappreciated or underutilised that it seems this year, now that he's close to goal, he can just pop them over. And Mayo, like I said, offensively look, look a threat. Yeah, and I guess I always remember Stephen Rockford saying when he was pushed about playing Aidan O'Shea in different positions, it was like he, he you want him everywhere. You want him in midfield, you want him centre-half forward, you want him full forward. But um, yeah, definitely feel like that if, when they have, Mayo have a good enough team that they can afford to have Aidan O'Shea up in the full forward line, it's uh, it's definitely more threatening full forward line. Uh, and it kind of take, he, his attention kind of takes the attention away from the fullbacks and stuff. But the second game on, on Sunday is four o'clock. The second main game is Cork versus Kerry uh, of essentially a Munster title Um shout albeit a semi-final how do you see this one going and I guess Kerry have been um, a series to be by pre-lockdown and post-lockdown after doing the five in a row I don't think people need, can underestimate um, the hunger that Kerry will have in terms of trying to put what they would feel wrong in last year's couple of all Ireland finals which are epic games but ultimately Kerry let them do the five in a row Yeah and and the feeling you get from Kerry is is they're a little bit desperate for it in that sense they, they kind of know if you know, if Dublin win the All Ireland this year, what's going to stop them next year? Um, and it's because of everything with with COVID and all the distractions around it. You know, if Kerry, if you like, need to come in and win it uh, and get their first one. Uh, with the same regard to Mayo, you know, that there's no fans, there's less distractions around an All Ireland final week in the in that sense. The you know, there's no going down the town. You know, the Saturday, the Thursday before an All Ireland final, and everyone is, is telling you to stop Dublin winning the five in a row. So maybe all those kind of distractions will help the team, the likes of Mayo and Kerry this year, if, if they are to get out of, you know, their the provincial championship. Look, Cork, I think, have, you know, in both codes, probably been the most disappointing county over the last. You know, probably ten years. Yeah, um, even, they've just been underachieving, haven't they? They got to mm. the thirteen All Ireland hurling final, and then they won the twenty ten All Ireland football final. Yeah, and everyone forgets the the replay in twenty thirteen. But the first game, the by the 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 cornerback from Clare coming up off the left, and uh, you know, Cork are champions, and maybe it drives them on. And all of a sudden, you've won two All Irelands at different codes in four years, and you know, not many other counties have achieved that in in recent times. So. You know, Cork never really kicked off in that 2010 side, and uh, maybe with the establishment of Dublin and Donegal coming good, and you know, Kerry are always thereabouts that stopped them. But but Cork have always been able to produce good footballers, and you know, they're always there thereabouts at underage. You know, Kerry are, are, are such a dominant threat, but you know, Cork are able to produce players across both codes, and with everything that's happened and you wouldn't put a pass Cork, but I suppose with Kerry so focused on, on getting out of Munster and, you know, the platform that gives them, you know, you expect Kerry to be right on the money. The couple of league games they've had, they've won the league, they they, they kind of had to win those games to win it. So there's, there, there's been that knockout sense already for them, if you like. And, you know, Cork, again, Division Three um, football, this year and, and it sort of hurt them because you know you want to be playing high quality teams challenge games are great and all but you know even in the last couple of games you want to be playing you know a team like 
like Ross Common or Armada are going to give you a really good game, and 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 that's going to hurt Cork this year. But you know, everyone hopes that Cork can put in a really good performance and also make more strides in the next three or four years because they're such an underachieving county. And even when you know when mm. when we were growing up, I suppose we we spent a lot of summers in Cork, but Cork were always. I mean, they were class, weren't they? The Cork team, the Rocco Sullivan and the Hurling, Ben and Jerry. Uh, even in football, you know, when Michael Shields was marking the Gooch Cooper, it seemed every every summer in the Munster final, and you know, Donegal O'Connor and, and and guys like this, especially in twenty ten when they did win that All Ireland, and you know, it's a real shame they didn't kick on because there were some great great teams, and you know, Cork were in dire need, especially with all the stuff that that's happened in the county board over the last six or seven years, and you could write a book on it. Uh, it, it almost seems that they kind of need some sort of lift. Yeah, I I always struck in our summers down in Cork, Sean, when we uh, just did how much of a hurling county it ultimately is, uh, especially the part of East Cork that we were from, and they just they didn't really seem to care about the footballers until, until they won the All Ireland and would rub our nose in it. But yeah, I, I think that's just kind of see in the culture. And one other thing on the Cork Kerry games, it feels like every single Cork Kerry game last year has gone the same way, where Cork might start well, and for one minute you were like, "Geez, Cork are going to win," and then Kerry just absolutely battered them because I think at the time to- at the moment they're just too far apart, aren't they? Mm, yeah, and, and it's very hard to bridge that gap, but I'd say there's a lot of people in West Cork and down in Castlehaven that wouldn't appreciate Cork being called a, a hurling county. There's a lot of staunch football um, country now. Now some say Castlehaven is among you know, the biggest football country in the world, and in Ireland rather. And uh, yeah, look, Cork have really been, been topsy-turvy. Like I said, Division 3 doesn't do them any favours. I mean, it's no way to prepare um, those couple of games for, you know, the Division One champions, if if you like, and the gap is 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 huge in, in yeah. Gaelic football terms. So, yeah, you know, here's hoping they put in a performance. There was a performance uh, was a last year or the year before where you know it was a little bit more positive from Cork. They they ran Kerry that a little bit closer. They showed signs that um they have a little bit more. They played Dublin in 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 the All Ireland quarter final was it, uh, and then ran them a little bit closer than or the Super Eights rather. Super Eights. They played a little bit better uh, than what they were supposed, or kind of what they were predicted to. Him. You know, they have a few really good players there, and in in, um, in Conley, a man from from Nemo. Um, you no, know, he's a, he's a threat for them. So, look, you you would fancy Kerry, but but you know, you never ride off Cork. Mm, absolutely, and just to finish on the football games, Longford Leash is one thirty Sunday, Wicklow Mead one thirty Sunday, Kildare Offaly five thirty Sunday. They're the th- three other Leinster games. West Mead Dublin, obviously the the day before, and then Fermanagh down. Um, on Sunday as well and there's Kevin Antrim on Saturday in the Ulster quick word on the herd and then before we move on uh, Dublin Cork how do you see this one going we might as well stick with the Cork team there um, massive game for both counties in the terms of like how their season can be portrayed I guess with the current system you can get on a bit of a run and suddenly be one game off an all-earned qu- qu- uh, semi-final if you if you get to the truth through the qualifiers here yeah and, and Cork were, were so disappointing against Waterford they were um, they were very 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 poor and didn't start well and, and sort of they're still relying on like we said last week the likes of Horgan and the deal of hand to get them out of trouble and, and when they don't really prior as well as they normally do then they are up against it um Dublin I suppose like we said on on Monday's show the comeback was good it was arguably a little too late there's big selection issues for for Matty Kenny very interested to see what he does I, I'd say Ronan Hayes will be on um, from the start, whether he sticks with with Davy Coe, who's a little bit smaller, a little bit quicker, a, a, a full forward, if you like, and have that as the two man inside board line, and Donald Burke dropping a bit deeper. You know, I still, you, you think it, you might want to see Trollier from the start, or whether he sticks with Rush, Liam Rush again as well. You know, so there is issues for, for Maddie Kenny to iron out. It'll be the third game now um, that Dublin have played. So could that play a factor in terms of fatigue and, you know, the lack of game game time for some of the players and you know it's Cork's second game so you know there, there's all those hidden elements there's, there's no doubt that Cork will, will be fancying their chances and we'll be hoping to you know put in put in a good performance and, and get through uh, but, but you know Dublin Cork aren't the side that maybe they were two or three years ago and maybe they are a little bit further off from the likes of Tipperary you know, Limerick, Kenny, uh, Galway. Uh, so maybe maybe it is an opportunity for Dublin uh, to, to, like you say, get on that roll and see see where the, the winter takes it. Yeah, and I guess Cork can be a bit of a streaky team as well, so you can never rule them out um, in, in any game. And like we said, if they can just get on a run. Well, yeah, it could be the battle of the free takers. Um, 
because Donald Burke missed, missed a few sort of handy ones in the first half against Kilkenny, ones he would have been disappointed with. And, you know, Cork obviously a pal Horgan and, and you can't afford to give away too many fouls or, or even open play opportunities to, for the likes of Horgan and Harnady. Um, so Dublin will have to be very disciplined, which they, they were at times against Kilkenny. Um, but, you know, the, the Cork will be looking at the three goals Dublin conceded in that first half an hour and think, yeah, we can we can definitely create chances and, and Horgan himself will be looking to get on the score sheet, no doubt. All right, so outside then, moving on to the golf, you wanted to quickly touch on the Shell Houston Open. Um, it's Masters time coming up in two weeks. We're actually, for those that aren't aware, we're having a live preview on all Facebook channels. We'll, we'll actually launch a bit of social media stuff over the weekend with Maliki Clerken on Tuesday, 11 o'clock on live and I'll be up straight on your podcast feeds later on that day for Masters Week, Sean. Uh, pretty excited for that, but there's a week before with the likes of Podrick Harrington you mentioned and Brooks in the field. Um, there could be a couple of storylines going into this week. Yeah, and, and there always is from the Shell Houston Open. It's it's traditionally the week before um, the Masters. You know, recent winners, uh, Latano Griffin, who, who's been really impressive. Uh, Ian Poulter, who's actually withdrawn um, because of back pain, hoping to be fit for Augusta. But it, it is, it's going to be a great week. And another one of those weeks that will tell us a huge amount going into Augusta. It's it's only Brooks's second or third appearance, I think, since his back injury forced him out of the, the US Open. Um, so he'll be really looking to, to, you know, not necessarily compete and exhaust a huge amount of energy, but find something and in a swing or, or or put a couple of good rounds together. And you know, if he does have a good week and he he is up there somewhere, you know, there'll be a lot of talk about him. And uh, for Augusta at the moment, he's just a little bit off the the favourites uh, in terms of the pricing. But but a lot of people will have high hopes for for Kepka not only this week but but going into Augusta. There's also a few other. Storylines to touch on, like like we said, Harrington is playing uh, this week coming off, uh, you know, a decent week in Bermuda. It was the back nine on Sunday that cost him, you know, really top 10 or or maybe a top 15 p- finish and uh, just finishing outside the top 20. Uh, there's also another one, Phil Mickelson's playing this week. Now, w- why is it a storyline? He, he's been playing, he's, he's eligible for the first time this year on the, the Champions Tour, which is the over 50s tour in America. And he, um, he's turned down, if you like, the, the chance at the final big event on the, the PGA Champions Tour. It's the Charles Schwab Challenge. It's the sort of the, you know, the Tour Championship, if you like. It's it's the end of the race, or the end of the order of merit. Um, and he's playing the Shell Houston Open this week. So that, that maybe gives you an insight into his mindset. It's a bit of an interesting choice. You know, a lot of people would say, go for the Charles Schwab, win it, uh, win again on the Champions Tour. But, you know, he's probably looking at Augusta thinking he's only got a couple of more cracks, you know, uh, before. Are you, are you building up to, are you building up to a, a Phil Mickelson tip for the Masters here next week? Am I, well, do well, I, I'm just, do I have like to be worried? I, like I said, at yours open, he's always worth uh, a euro each way. You know, mm. you know what you're going to get. He's not going to be tied 50th. Um, you'll either miss the cut or, or he'll no give way. you a bit of value. And let's not mistake you. If you go back in the last 10 years, he's had a, fairly decent record at Augusta he obviously he's won there but he's been in contention a few times knows the course it's a left-handers golf course like people are tipping Bubba because he can fade it he can draw it he can you know shape balls that that other golfers on tour can't but also the fact that he's a left-hander and left-handers have traditionally done well and their scoring average is is considerably better even though you think of how few left-handers there is on tour uh, but I just think it's it's a sort of insight into Phil's mindset that he is playing this week um, and not the Charles Schwab and, and I suppose he's in his own head definitely thinking look he's only got a couple of more chances at Augusta trying to win another one or you know compete come Sunday uh, you know there's lots of talks that they're going to lengthen Augusta even more you know they're going to make it harder um, and that's not going to suit the likes of Phil you know Tiger guys like this that are that little bit older but you know maybe I, I wouldn't I, I'd be keeping my, my eye on him this week that's for sure no, I've definitely got to get you off that Phil Perch. But yeah, I suppose you have a point with the left-handers. I know Mike Weir's won it. Um, I just think Phil, you know, comparable to his form with Phil is a bit, um, you know, chalk and cheese, I guess, at the moment. But before, before we move on there, go on. Yeah, there's also a few more. Dustin Johnson, yeah, um, was, yeah. Who, who's been out for COVID the last couple of weeks. He's playing for the first time this week going into Augusta. I mean, it was only, was it three or four years ago that he was favourite going into Augusta? And then he had that, you know, horrific incident where he fell down the stairs, I think, and mm. hurt his neck. Um, on the the Tuesday or Wednesday, it was Masters uh, so, Week anyway, wasn't you know, it? Yeah, yeah, it was it, it it was a couple of days before um the the first round, and 
you know, Dustin Johnson has been unbelievable for him, and I think people forget about it because you know the the COVID in the last couple of weeks, and you know even at the US Open, you know he was playing really really poorly, but he, you know he was still you know there or thereabouts if you like, and sort of gave himself a half chance by Bryson taking the game away from everyone. So yeah, I, look, he's he's the world number one. Yeah, I, I felt he um I felt he threw away the you know, PGA himself. He never quite. Hmm. Uh, did himself justice, I guess. Maybe a bit harsh on in the final. Yeah, round maybe. Yeah. As well, but... You could argue more. Kawa just sort of mm, no, didn't won lose it. it, won it in the sense, and maybe John Johnson didn't lose it. He just lost to the better player. You know, that there, there certainly is that that element. But I think where Dustin Johnson has improved in the last three or four years is when you know when when Dustin Johnson had a lot more missed cuts and a lot more tied 40ths and 50ths where the best players in in the world you know have that ability where even if they make the cut by on the number or by a couple of shots they still put in a you know a seven a 67 or 68 combination on the weekend and, and they're in the tied top 15 top 20 and that just builds for you know order merit points and world ranking points and that's that's something that dj has improved a lot in this game and you know there's a lot of stats around Bryson DeChambeau's driving, but Dustin Johnson puts it out there, you know, further than most. Uh, and he'll have a lot of wedges and low irons into the green. So for Augusta, it'll be interesting to see how he gets on in his first competitive start in a, in a while. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other names in the field, Tony Fino, Jason Day, Danny Willis, Lee Westwood, you know, Jordan Speeds as well. I guess that's a bit of a story down coming to the Masters. Don't really know what's going on with his game as well. But um, exciting week overall there in Houston. And um, it's kind of a perfect tournament and prep for Masters. A decent enough field, I guess. And the likes of Bryson are obviously taking it off and Tiger and Rory. So. Mm, uh, Lee Westwood is someone that I I backed for the US Open once he made the cut because it's it's a diff- to get top 10 because it's a difficult course. And he, he, he's so experienced. He'll keep himself in and just missed. I think he broke the last couple. But again, this is a, you know, Lee West is not going to have many more cracks of the whip for the Masters. He's not going to qualify for um, that many more Masters. He's qualified. He's in. Um, so he's a player to watch out for. And now he's quite a low price, all things considering, but his form has been very, very good. Uh, with the Ryder Cup coming down next year, he might have one eye on, on one of his last Masters here, may probably more than likely. And he might, in the back of his mind, still harbour ambitions for a Ryder Cup. So who knows? Uh, that's just one player to keep an eye on. I'm sure we'll hear more from Maliki about it as well. Absolutely. I know Mal- Maliki loves the call, so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, here, it sounds like it's 2010 again if we're going in with Phil Mixon and Lee Westwood, but uh, look, I'm all for that as well. And the Masters is a very uh, course, uh, horses for courses. But listen, appreciate you listening on Tackling Sport there. Um, if you missed our Premier League predictions episode, that's also in your podcast feed. Now, let us know what you think about separating the two for the weekend preview. We might look at doing that and the review and maybe space out the episodes a bit more over the week. But we're experimenting at the moment. Um, but we're really enjoying doing that. So yeah, all that's left to say is um, keep up with us on social media. And uh, it's goodbye from Sean. Bye. And goodbye, Marcel. Have a great weekend and we will chat to you on Monday.